position of Scandinavian countries today is very unique. They regularly occupy high positions in various world economic ratings. The image of ideal states has been created around them, where salaries are high, goods are high quality, living is easy and pleasant. The Scandinavian system is often enthusiastically called true socialism, offering a comparison of the USSR in the 20th century and modern Scandinavia to make a choice in favor of the latter. To figure out if there is socialism in the Scandinavian countries, we'll have to look to history, find out how they have developed over the past 200 years and how they have come to their present situation. Sweden, Denmark, and Norway embarked on the path of industrialization in the middle of the 19th century. But in 50 years, Scandinavia has managed to become one of the most highly developed industrial centers and to concentrate in its hands a large part of the world market. A small domestic market forced them to expand export-oriented production from the very beginning. For example, Sweden had become a major supplier of telegraph poles and railway sleepers for British industry, by then the largest in the world. In Denmark, in the second half of the 19th century, Two-thirds of exports were agricultural products such as meat, milk, and butter. As a result, the processing industry and transport enterprises started to grow quickly. Following Denmark, Swedish agriculture underwent the same process. Due to a number of specific features, as well as the relatively high cost of labor power, the only possibility of increasing production was technical re-equipment. Having established its own mechanical engineering, the Scandinavian bourgeoisie gave a powerful impulse to the development of science, which resulted in a wave of inventions that increased productivity. From the industrial production of nitrogen fertilizers, to a milking machine, to dynamite and ball bearings. The lack of coal led to the appearance of the first hydroelectric power stations in the 1880s. Sweden and Norway were among the pioneers who organized the long-distance transmission of electricity and its use. The need to link enterprises scattered across the country led to a strong increase of shipping and railways. In parallel with production, the financial sector also developed. Corporatization led to the centralization of capital and the creation of large industrial groups. An additional factor in the stable development was the fundamental neutrality of Sweden, which avoided spending a lot of money for the armed forces. The development of Denmark was somewhat slower due to wars with Prussia for the possession of border territories. Accelerated economic development was facilitated by the political strengthening of the bourgeoisie, which achieved a number of laws that removed obstacles for trading and business very early, in the 1840s to 1850s. By the end of the 1860s, with the formal preservation of the monarchies, political power belonged mainly to the bourgeoisie. Thus. By the beginning of the 20th century, large-scale industry had completely developed in the Scandinavian countries, gained solid positions, and became famous all over Europe. Despite the apparent insignificance and remoteness from global processes, these countries played a major role in the European market. The Scandinavian working class grew as fast as the Scandinavian industry. The centers of this growing powerful movement in all three countries were the social democratic parties and the trade union confederations controlled by them. On the one hand, this strengthened the movement, made a big contribution to its unity and intensification of the struggle against the power of capital, but on the other, it led to the ideological weakening of the proletariat, which fell under the reformist trends. Fear of the social revolution and the desire for reform as a means of gradual evolution became stronger and stronger, oddly enough, as workers gained more and more power in the struggle against capital. In 1905, the Young Scandinavian Labor Movement, led by the Social Democrats, demonstrated its strength when, due to the danger of the Swedish intervention in Norway, the unions began to threaten the government with a general strike and oppose the military recruitment system. In the next few years, the class struggle in Scandinavia escalated greatly. The vigorous pressure of the proletariat in the early 1910s forced the Scandinavian bourgeoisie to make their first serious concession, raising real wages reducing the working day to 9 or 10 hours, introducing labor protection laws, a pension system, etc. All these victories with the dominance of the right-wing social democrats reflected in the proletarian masses with the growth of reformist sentiments which started to find support not only among the trade union bureaucracy but also among the labor aristocracy. During World War I, the Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish social democrats declared full support for their bourgeois governments. 
Opportunism inevitably caused the strengthening of the left social democratic wing, which required the continuation of the class struggle in wartime. The strengthening of the left and the tremendous growth of the strike movement in 1916 to 1918 created a real danger of revolution. The events in Russia and Germany frightened the Scandinavian bourgeoisie and made it force events. The so-called democratic breakthrough began. A series of democratic reforms that particularly shocked conservative Sweden. On the other side, the working class was handled by social democracy, which frightened the masses with the horrors of the civil war. But the post-war crisis of 1920 to 1921 uncovered the deceitfulness of the reformist politics. The bourgeoisie began to take these privileges from the working people, causing a new rise in the strike movement. Once again, Scandinavian social democrats saved the capitalists by restricting the struggle to petty economic demands or by completely leading the masses into the mainstream reformism. In 1929, the Great Depression happened and its waves reached Scandinavia. The consequences of the Great Depression in the form of impoverishment of the people, rising unemployment, the ruin of small farms, and the strengthening of anti-labor laws of the late 1920s caused a new wave of radicalization among the masses. In the spring and summer of 1931, major clashes between workers, the unemployed, and the police and army took place. The number and influence of the Scandinavian Communist parties began to grow. The Communists organized strikes and demonstrations, participated in the creation and organization of the unemployed, and made big efforts in the agitation, citing the success of the Soviet Union after the implementation of the first five-year plan. During these events, the right-wing social democracy, which has rescued the bourgeoisie more than once, comes forward with a program of class cooperation and preservation of the existing order, skillfully using socialist phrases, referring to the real successes of the planned economy in the USSR at the time, denouncing the communists who allegedly caused revolutions and civil wars. The Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian social democrats won the majority of votes in the parliamentary elections of 1932 to 1933. In the first period of the creation of state monopoly capitalism, a certain number of measures were taken to stabilize society. A significant increase in taxes and the issuance of loans allowed the Scandinavian states not only to finance the creation of the new workplaces, but also to cheapen industrial loans for private individuals. At the same time, the export of capital abroad was prohibited or severely restricted, which allowed state banks to accumulate significant foreign exchange reserves. In the agricultural sphere, a number of prohibitive import duties were introduced, and state subsidization of production was guaranteed. The government organized the centralized procurement of goods at fixed prices. Under populist slogans, limited measures were taken to help the unemployed, disabled people, large families, and low-income families. Social democracy curbed the working class, thereby eliminating both the danger of a revolutionary explosion and the fascist threat. The true symbol of this ideological hegemony can be illustrated by the unprecedented compromise of 1938, according to which in exchange for the bourgeois promises of a fair division of revenue, the trade unions promised not to discuss the question of the institution of private property and the injustice of the wage labor system. The result of this agreement was a significant reduction of labor conflicts to zero in 1940. In Norway, a similar agreement between the Trade Union Center and the Confederation of Entrepreneurs was signed even earlier, in 1935. In Denmark, the role of the superclass regulatory center between labor and capital in 1936 was assumed by the Social Democratic government. Thus, considering other factors such as improving the economic situation, the influx of foreign capital, further considerations, and centralization of production, Scandinavia recovered from the effects of the Great Depression. But World War II interrupted this trend. Denmark and Norway were occupied by fascists, and Sweden, despite the principle of neutrality, suffered serious financial losses. Another threat arose. The strength and influence of the proletarian parties grew in Norway and Denmark. In Sweden, against the backdrop of the successes of the Soviet state in the struggle against fascism, pro-communist sentiments also strengthened. The successes of the Communists in the Swedish Union leadership elections, the parliamentary elections of 1944 in Sweden and 1945 in Denmark, signal alarming trends. That's why, in 1945, with the full approval of the bourgeoisie, 
the Social Democrats took a number of measures aimed at easing social tensions. The state apparatus was cleansed of collaborators. Wages were raised everywhere. Existing agreements between trade union centers and entrepreneurs were supplemented by a number of concessions from the latter. At the same time, there was an accelerated economic recovery. The capitalists feared a recurrence of the post-war economic downturn and the social crisis of the 1920s, which could now become a prelude to the revolution. However, the Scandinavian countries could not restore their pre-war level of production on their own. Therefore, in April of 1948, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden joined the Marshall Plan, accepting assistance on American terms. These changes were accompanied by the Social Democrats' communist threat, hysteria. The first clearly anti-communist course was taken by the Danish Social Democrats in 1945. In 1947, the Norwegian Labour Party joined the anti-communist campaign. In April 1949, the Social Democratic governments of Denmark and Norway approved joining NATO. Swedish reformists have traditionally maintained neutrality, however, they supported anti-communists, for example, by providing NATO assistance in Korea or systematically clearing communists from trade unions. Meanwhile, the communists themselves were by no means ready to seize political power. The dissolution of the Comintern in 1943 allowed the national communist parties to formulate a development strategy in accordance with the characteristics of their countries. The root of the problem in this case lay in the social democratic past of party leaders, breaking through in the form of certain trends. In all three countries, the communist parties were split under the influence of proponents of reformism. As a result, by the time the economic recovery of the mid-1950s began, very specific conditions had developed in Scandinavia that marked the beginning of the era of Scandinavian socialism. The powerful labor movement of Scandinavia continued to push social democracy to expand social security, but the miracle did not happen. Inflation continued to grow, unemployment continued, and in the 1960s the growth of the Scandinavian industry began to slow down. As a result of the crisis in the 1970s, the Swedish textile industry collapsed. Monstrous problems struck Danish and especially Swedish shipbuilding, which was the second most productive after the United States. However, the bourgeoisie did not abandon the social democratic experiment. Firstly, the powerful labor movement, which still unites the overwhelming number of workers in these countries, expressed its readiness to fight for every cent. And secondly, the bourgeoisie was still frightened by the danger of revolution, which was facilitated by the spread of radical socialist ideas among youth. But as the communist threat receded, the Scandinavian bourgeoisie began its counteroffensive. Most clearly, this process can be traced on the example of the standard of Scandinavian socialism, Sweden. In 1980, for the first time in many years, the Swedish bourgeoisie attempted a massive lockout after the trade union centers rejected the government's proposed increase in wages by 2.3% instead of 11%, as the unions demanded. In the mid-1980s, the Social Democrats themselves began to abandon the state regulation of the economy. State support for social programs became an inadmissible luxury for monopoly capital, and the transformation of public services into private ones, on the contrary, opened up new profitable markets. In the early 1990s, the Social Democrats were defeated in the elections and ceded power to the Conservatives. Conservatives began to take even tougher measures, but it did not meet any resistance from the side of social democracy. In 1994, Swedish workers voted for the Social Democrats again, hoping for their help. But under the new conditions, reformers continued to pursue an anti-people policy. Unemployment benefits, child benefits were reduced, and housing benefits became difficult to obtain. In 1996, private competition was allowed in the electric power industry, which led to an increase in tariffs. Education, medicine, caring for children, and the elderly gradually moved to the rails of private enterprise, while at the same time relegating state institutions to a very low level. The dismantling of the welfare state system provoked a massive protest, peaking in 1996 in the form of large-scale demonstrations and strikes. However, realizing the falsity of reformist ideas, the masses could not find new landmarks. Understanding that the traditional right-wingers are even worse, the workers who voted against them ensured a new victory in 1998 for the Social Democrats, who 
whose rule lasted until 2006, when the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Sweden showed the lowest election results in its entire history. The right-wing government returned to power and began its term with a sharp reduction in unemployment benefits and social insurance rates. During the crisis of 2008 to 2010, unemployment reached 12%, labor intensification increased, labor law reforms led to an easier dismissal of a permanent worker. In Denmark, the situation was somewhat different. In 1982, the Social Democrats voluntarily handed over the reins of government to a coalition of conservatives and liberals who hastily put forward plans to dismantle the welfare state and implement privatization, causing a series of strikes. In March 1985, in connection with a unilateral revision of collective agreements between trade union centers and business unions, a wave of so-called Easter strikes took place, uniting more than half a million workers. Just like in Sweden, with the revolutionary threat becoming nothing more than a bad dream for capitalists, the Danish social democracy began to carry out reactionary reforms. A three-stage labor reform reduced the term for the payment of unemployment benefits from 8.5 to 4 years. The condition for receiving these benefits were tightened. In 1998, the program for early retirement, which was introduced back in 1979, was reformed. The deceptive tax reform of 1993 lowered the income tax rate while increasing municipal taxes, therefore striking people with low and middle incomes. In the framework of increasing efficiency, some functions in the healthcare system, pharmaceuticals, dentistry, maxillofacial surgery, were transferred into private hands. Such events could not raise the popularity of the Social Democrats, who were defeated in 2001 having again ceded power to the liberal conservative government. And so, there was a continued move in the anti-worker direction. In 2010, support for the unemployed fell from four years to two, and pension reform in 2012 raised the retirement age to 69 years. Norway moved in the same direction, although liberal reforms began here later, from the beginning of the 2000s. Having examined the vast history of the Scandinavian countries, we can conclude that there is no socialism in Scandinavia and never was. The private ownership of the means of production is preserved here. There is unemployment, inflation, and poverty. The Scandinavian model is capitalism, softened by a magnitude of social guarantees provided by direct and indirect taxes. And even these guarantees, the workers have to persistently uphold in our time. All of this became possible because during the periods of the terrifying scope of the class struggle, social democracy acted as a traitor to the interests of the working class. The Scandinavian proletariat is still shocking the whole world with its excellent organization, and this organization could become the basis of the proletarian dictatorship. But the social democrats stopped the workers halfway, making them satisfied with handouts of social guarantees. As soon as the revolutionary threat came to naught, the bourgeoisie went on the offensive, robbing the proletariat of one right after another. Deprived of its political leadership, the proletarian communist party, the workers are unable to turn the tide. All their actions only delay the inevitable defeat. The example of Denmark, Norway, and especially Sweden eloquently testifies to the falsehood of theories of a peaceful transition from capitalism to socialism. Giving workers any privileges, the bourgeoisie seeks to go into the counterattack at the earliest opportunity, returning previously lost positions. The path to a better life for each worker and the whole working class relies exclusively in the mainstream of the class struggle, of the achievement of the working class power, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the elimination of the capitalist system, and the transition to building socialism. There is no other way. Stay tuned.